Hello AP Calculus students and welcome back to day four limits algebraically which is in our topic one limits and continuity. As a reminder we said we'd explore limits and really every topic in calculus from four different viewpoints. The first was tabularly building tables we did that on day two. Uh, the second was graphically so either having a graph or creating a graph to find limits that was last class and today we're going to explore limits algebraically uh, which really is a fancy way to say using an equation. So we have two daily learning objectives for today. Uh, the first is we want to be able to algebraically evaluate limits using properties of limits when appropriate. And then second, uh, we want to be able to understand the difference between an indeterminate form and an undefined limit. Evaluating the former, reminder there are two concepts here, the former means the first, right? This would be the latter. Evaluating the former, these indeterminate forms, when possible. So let's look at our opener. Our opener suggests that you use a graphing calculator to help you, but I'm going to tell you that there's a pretty important shortcut here. So we're going to be given a function, in this case we can think the graph y equals negative 3x plus 1, and we are asked to find the limit as x approaches negative 1 of this function, then negative 1 of this function, and then the limit negative 1 of this piecewise function. So although you can graph, let's see if you can find a faster way to do it, hint, hint, without graphing. Why don't you go ahead, work with your group, work on your own, and once you're done, unpause, and we'll discuss your conclusions. Ready, set, go. All right, well, hopefully conclusion-wise, you guys really said, why don't we just try substituting or evaluating or plugging in negative 1 in for the x here? And let's see if that works. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to show the correct notation here, and you need to be careful, um, we're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the function negative 3x plus 1. Right? I replaced f of x with what f of x is equal to. Then I'm going to directly substitute or plug in the negative 1 for x. When we shift away from finding a limit, to just substituting in an x value, we no longer need the limit because when you plug in negative 1, now you're talking about what happens at a point. It's no longer a limit. So we're going to do negative 3 times negative 1 plus 1. That becomes 3 plus 1, which is 4. Now our question here is, is that right? And we probably should use a graphing calculator to verify this. I actually have all these ready and set to go for you. So here's negative, I don't need all of them. Um, here's negative 3x plus 1, and we're looking at what happens at negative 1. And so at negative 1, right, we can see right here exactly at negative 1 the y value is 4. As you approach from the left and from the right, you're getting closer to 4. So it seems like, yes, that is the right answer to the limit, and all we had to do was substitute a negative 1. Well, that seems pretty cool. Let's try another. For this one, again, practicing that nice notation. First, we're going to show what f of x is. That's 2x squared. Then we're actually, instead of finding the limit, what happens close to negative 1, we're just going to figure out what happens exactly at negative 1, and so we no longer need the limit. Then this just becomes 2 times 1, and 2 times 1 is 2. Did we do this correctly? Well, I've got my Desmos up here. We're looking at negative 1. And yeah, it looks like exactly at negative 1 is 2. And as you get close to negative 1 on both sides, they're both getting closer to 2. Cool. All right, last one. Well, if we look at this piecewise function, okay, we might say, all right, here's our limit as x approaches negative 1. What do we replace f of x with? There are two different branches up here. And I'll highlight those. We can do one in blue and one in purple, I guess. Uh, which branch do we use? Well, you might say we're looking at negative 1. And so if you look at both of these, this top one says to the left or less than negative 1. This bottom one says greater than negative 1, but also equal to negative 1. So it might make sense that since we are equal to negative 1, we should probably use that bottom branch of our piecewise function. And then we're actually going to substitute in negative 1, so it becomes negative 1 minus 1 squared plus 5. Okay, so negative, do the inside, negative 2 squared plus 5. Negative 2 squared is positive 4, but then we get a negative, so this is actually negative 4 plus 5, which is positive 1. 
and then we check. Right? So um, I'll get back to the check in a second. Um, however, let's kind of summarize what we're doing right here. It appears that if you are given any equation f of x, then we can evaluate the limit as x approaches some value using this formula down below. So instead of looking at the limit, we can just take the a value, substitute it into our function, and just find what happens at the point. So instead of finding the limit, we just find what happens at that point. And that's pretty darn useful uh, because it's fairly tedious to have to graph a function first or create a table just to find the limit before finding the limit. Awkward. Um, but does it always work? Well, let's double check that part C up above. Uh, we practiced graphing a piecewise function or two last class, and we're going to do another one today. Piecewise functions tend to be um, a big hole in my students' knowledge, and I find the more we graph them, the better we get. Uh, so let's go ahead and graph part C, the piecewise function, down below. We'll try to do it a little bit more efficiently than last class, and I'll show you how. So first, negative 1 is where we switch from one equation to another. So negative 1 is this guy right here. You certainly don't have to put a dashed line. In fact, I usually don't, but I'm just going to illustrate what's happening here. We have this function negative 2x minus 3. And I know that at negative 1, this function is going to change into something else. This function is only good for x is less than negative 1. That's this side, right? To the left is less than negative 1. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do, instead of doing the whole function, is I'm just going to substitute negative 1 in here. So negative 2 times negative 1 is 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So just to show what I did, I did negative 2, substituted in negative 1, and then subtracted 3. That becomes 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. I made the point negative 1 comma negative 1, which means right at negative 1, my blue function has an output of negative 1. And then I'm going to do an open circle. We'll come back to that in just a bit. Last but not least, I know that my slope in negative 2x minus 3 is down 2 over 1. So down 2 over 1 would move me here, but that's on the right side of negative 1, so I think I want to go to the left. Up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, and now we have our function. Or at least part of our piecewise function. Uh, do we fill in this circle here? Well, this says only for x is strictly less than negative 1. There's no equal to, so we're not going to fill in that circle. We'll leave it open. Okay, let's try the other. The other is going to be a parabola, hence the square. Okay? And this parabola starts at positive 1, positive 5, and opens downwards. So uh, positive 1, positive 5, I think, is going to be on the correct side, right? Positive 1, positive 5 is up here. And then my parabola is going to go, and I'm going to erase this in just a second, downwards. So let's see where the parabola ends up on this barrier, on this wall, where one function switches to the other. And to do that, I'm just going to substitute negative 1 in for the x, and I'll show the math over here. Negative, negative 1, minus 1 squared plus 5. Oh, wait, I actually did that up above, didn't I? That's just positive 1. So negative 1 comma 1 is where the parabola ends up on the wall. Open circle again. So now we know that we go up and then through symmetry over 2 over 2. It's going to go back down, and it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Looks something like this. Now, I mentioned that I usually don't put that dashed line. I'll, in fact, get rid of it right now just to clean things up a bit. Um, when I look at this, I think there probably needs to be a point at negative 1. Currently, there's no point here, just two open circles. Uh, but our piecewise function tells us x can be equal to negative 1. Uh, so let's go ahead and fill in this circle right here. All right, there's my graph. Well. The second box over here says, prove that the limit of f of x as x approaches, I'm not sure why it says 3, awkward, negative 1, does not exist algebraically. Well, hopefully, clearly, you can see that the limit as we approach negative 1, that's right here, does not exist. On the left side, we're approaching this guy. On the right side, we're approaching something else. So to show that, let's prove each one-sided limit, review from last class. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left side of f of x, right? And I'm just going to do it all together. I'm going to say is not equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right side of f of x. But we need to go further, right? We can't just say the limits aren't equal. 
I would say, well, what are the limits equal to? So let's take this out. We'll say the limit, and actually we can just see this graphically, can't we? From the left side, we approach negative 1. From the right side, we approach positive 1. Could we do this with equations? What if we didn't have this graph? Could we find those negative 1s and positive 1s? Certainly, because we are going to use the equation up above this piecewise function. And if I'm approaching on the left side of negative 1, then we have to think which equation is in control on the left side. And the equation that's in control is negative 2x minus 3, right? We can even see that visually with this nice linear function over here. And I'm going to prove that that is not equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right side. And the function that's in control there is this crazy parabola, negative right, x minus 1 squared plus 5, that guy. All right, well, how do we do that? W well, how did we do these guys up here? We just substituted, this is called direct substitution, we just substituted in the negative 1 into each equation. Let's see if that works here. We have negative 2 times negative 1 minus 3, and I'm pretty sure that's going to be not equal to negative, negative 1 minus 1 squared plus 5. Notice I no longer wrote the limit because I'm using our shortcut now. I'm saying instead of finding the limit, let's just see what happens at the point. Also notice that I somewhat ignored this negative and this positive over here. We'll have a further discussion later on down the road um, about why we can do that. But you can kind of visually see what's happening here too. Negative 2x plus 3 technically goes forever. And so even though we're looking at the left side, what we're really doing is we're finding a two-sided limit because both sides approach the same spot. So this negative doesn't really matter. And it's the same thing for the parabola. This goes down forever. So even though it says we're looking at the right side, you can look at both sides and get the same answer. All right, from here we've already done this math, right? We know that this guy becomes negative 1. We know that this guy becomes positive 1, and clearly, those are not equal. As soon as we know the one-sided limits aren't equal, we can do our cool symbol for therefore, and say the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x does not exist. So, looking up above, this shortcut was pretty nice, right? It seemed like all we had to do was just substitute in our values. But then part c threw us a snag because we said, oh, x is equal to negative 1. We tried substituting in negative 1. We got an answer, but overall, the answer ended up being does not exist. Do you see why the piecewise function had that issue? Well, it's because we're, of course, taking a shortcut. We're, instead of finding a limit, finding out what happens at the point. And at the point doesn't give us a full picture of what happens near the point. Now, many functions we study have a property that the limit as x approaches a and the value of the actual point f of a are equal, right? If you look at the opener on a and b, and I'm going to show you the two graphs right now, right? We have our two graphs right here, and I'll toggle back and forth. Here is one, and here is the other. Those two functions have a very specific property around negative 1 that makes it so we're allowed to use that shortcut. However, the piecewise function has a property around negative 1 that allows us to not use that shortcut. Can you put into words the difference between the two graphs? What property of a and b makes the limit the same as the value of the point? Well, hopefully you came up with something that had to do with the idea of continuity. Now, you might not have used that phrase, but we've talked about it a couple times, right? Um, this is clearly a line, a diagonal line, and it is continuous. We can start and draw this line without ever having to pick up our pencil. In fact, it's continuous at every point. So every point on here has the property that the limit will have the same value as the point that is the same for the parabola. No matter what limit you're looking for, instead of finding a limit, you can find the value at the point instead, and because this is continuous, the limit will equal the point. In fact, this piecewise function is almost continuous everywhere as well. If they had asked you the limit as x approaches negative 4, 
you could have just substituted negative 4 into the correct equation, the linear one, and you would have gotten the right answer for the limit. Same thing over here. You could have found the limit as x approaches whatever this value is, right? Positive 3 right here. And you could have just substituted 3 into your parabola. But there is one small spot on this piecewise function that is not continuous. Can you see where this function is not continuous? Well, yeah, as we draw this diagonal line, we have to stop, pick up our pencil, and then continue drawing the parabola up above, right? Right here, at x equals negative 1, our function is no longer continuous. And when a function is not continuous, the limit and the point do not always have the same value. So you can summarize that as best you want here, and we're going to go through and make that a little bit more mathematically accurate on the next page. Whenever you're ready, turn to that next page, and let's get rocking and rolling. Here we go. If a function is continuous at a specific point, then the following is true. The limit of the function is the same as what happens at the point. And that makes our evaluation of limits a lot easier because instead of having to graph or make a table, we can evaluate, and this is more commonly known as performing direct substitution for, the function at the given x value. So we just, instead of having to graph or make a table, we just substitute in this number into the equation and we're done. But again, in order to use this awesome shortcut, our function has to be continuous. So let's examine a few types of functions to discuss their continuity. We're going to begin with polynomials. A polynomial is defined as some number a sub 0, and I'll give you an example down below in just a second, times x to some power plus some other number times x to a power 1 smaller, plus all the way down to some other number times x to the 0th power. And as a reminder, anything to the 0th is just 1, so this really just ends with some number at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and give a few examples of polynomials. All right, here is one nice example. We could say y equals 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus 1x plus 0. And of course, you could have written that as 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus x. You don't need the 1, you don't need the 0. But that's still a polynomial and just showing you that we have x's to different powers and then we end with something that doesn't have an x. Now, we don't need to have all those in there as well. We could even do something like x to the 4th minus x squared. That's fine too, right? We don't have an x cubed. That would be like there's a 0 in front of the x cubed, and we don't have an x or a number at the end, but just picture them all being zeros. Technically, polynomials only have nice integer, and actually I should really say whole number values for your exponents, so we're not using any one-half powers, we're not using any um, irrational numbers like pi, just nice, easy exponents. Now, what about continuity of polynomials? You actually study this a bit in Algebra 2, right? They tell you if you have a polynomial that is x to the n, where n is even, then the general shape of the graph is it looks something like that. Or if there's a negative, of course, it could flip over, right? And then if you have x to the n, where n is odd, then you kind of get that cool S-shaped graph or if there's a negative, it would go the other way. Uh, now, it, things can happen close to the origin, right? Our graph could kind of bounce up and down. There could be turning points there. Uh, but no matter what, they kind of follow this general format. And you'll notice that I drew each of these functions without lifting up my pencil. All of these functions are continuous. So we can actually say that all polynomials are continuous. And so given any polynomial f of x, if you're asked to find the limit as x approaches a of a polynomial, we just find f of a. We just substitute a into our equation, and we're done. So let's take a look at these down below. You do need to be careful with your notation. I'm going to hit this over and over again. Um, it's one of those things that we try to be lazy on, and the AP exam does not um, reward that laziness. So, you do need to show a beginning and an end for each problem, and we're going to look at each of these. So, we have problem one, we've got our polynomials all the way down here, right? And they're asking us to perform or to find the limit for each one. So, good luck, 
try all four. Once you finish, discuss your answers with your group, and we will come back together at that point. Ready, set, go. All right, we're back. So, what do we need to show here? Um, the answer is, I will probably show a little bit too much work, but I would rather you show a little bit too much than not enough. So the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x um, actually means we're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of our function, negative x squared minus 5x. This is a polynomial, right? It's a downward facing parabola. And because it's a polynomial, we no longer need to find the limit, we can just find what happens at the point. And so to do that, we substitute in negative 2 squared minus 5 by negative 2. And you can show as much math from here as you'd like, uh, but I'm just going to do some mental math and come up with an answer. So we get 4, this is negative 4 plus 10, 10 minus 4 is 6, and we're set. Okay. For our second one, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 1, and what function is called g of x? Oh, it's this guy up here, negative x to the 17th minus x to the twelfth minus one, and we need to evaluate this at negative one. I tried to make these problems doable without a calculator. Um, usually the problems without a calculator uh, don't require any terrible math. Sometimes you might have to do some like, I don't know, two digit times one digit multiplication problems without a calculator, gasp or some basic division, but it's not too terrible. Okay, so as we go through here, I'm going to show a little bit more work. Um, let's see, negative 1 to an odd power stays negative, and negative 1 to an even power becomes positive. So this becomes 1 minus 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, minus another 1 is negative 1. All right, let's look at our next one. We're going to find the limit as x approaches e of pi. Now, translating what's going on here in a couple different ways, uh, most of my students tend to be comfortable that pi is approximately 3.141, so on and so forth. Should at least be going three places past the decimal each time. Uh, but most of my students are not comfortable with the fact of e. e is another one of these transcendental numbers, and it is very important for this year. All right, so we need to know that e is 2. Point what? Well, if you're not sure, you can always go ahead and pull it up in your calculator, right? Nothing bad. Try it now if you haven't already. Try plugging in E. Let's see what you get. Okay. Um, hopefully you got 2.7, and then it's 1, 8, 2, and you can do the same thing with pi. It goes forever. Um, but we should definitely know that E is somewhat smaller than 3 and somewhat larger than 2. The same way we know that pi is between 3 and 4. Actually, the running joke about pi is that engineers always just approximate it and say pi is pretty close to 3, let's call it 3. Um, they wouldn't do that with e. So 2.7 something. And again, we'll learn more about this later on. But for now, let's take a look. This is the limit as x approaches e of pi. Well, the first thing we'd have to ask is, is pi a polynomial? And the answer is technically no. Um, however, if we wanted to think about the graph of this function, right? This is our, whoops, that was supposed to be a highlighter. Um, this is our function y equals pi, which is just 3.141. Um, then we know, or hopefully we know, that that's just a horizontal line slightly above 3, like so. And if we're looking as x approaches e, so this is 2.718 down here, right? As we approach e on both sides, what y value do you get closer to? Well, we're staying at the y value of pi every time. Another way to think about this is there is nowhere to substitute e in, so we just keep this continuous function as our answer. The limit as we approach an x value of a constant function is just that constant. This is the output, the y value, and so it's just the y value. All right, let's get on to 4. The limit as x approaches negative 2 of h of x, so we find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this monstrosity, x squared plus 6x plus 8 over x squared minus 4. And then we substitute this in. It is very important that you use parentheses around the negative 2, otherwise you and your calculator are going to be getting some wrong answers and you'll be sad. 
uh, negative 2 squared minus 4. Let's see, this is 4 and 8 is 12, minus 12 is 0, 4 minus 4 is 0. I got 0 over 0. Um, what is that as a simplified answer? Well, try it on your calculator. If you try it there, you'll get an error or does not exist. All right, now, as you discuss this with your group, um, there might have been a few questions you had, and hopefully I answered them up above, um, but there is one extra question that we need to discuss, and that is problem four. Uh, because we said our direct substitution, substituting in a number in for the x's, uh, works as long as our function is a polynomial, because polynomials are continuous. This is certainly not a polynomial. This is known as a rational function, a ratio of polynomials. You're dividing one function by another. Um, and that might not be continuous. In fact, we should probably check each of these graphs just to make sure we did it correctly. 6, negative 1, pi, and that guy. Um, I'm pretty confident on the first three, and so in the interest of time, let's just go ahead and check this fourth problem. So I'm going to close this guy out, and we're going to look at this one right here. I don't need the rest of those, do I? Um, so as we look at this, uh, we can see that there is certainly a discontinuous piece. It looks like maybe at positive 2, right? As we follow this function up, it definitely gets closer to positive 2, goes up forever. As you follow it down, definitely over here. Uh, but the part we were interested in is the limit that we found. We found the limit as we approached negative 2, and we said the limit didn't exist. But if you look at negative 2, that's right here. To me, it looks like the limit does exist, doesn't it? I feel like we get closer and closer to the same spot on each side. Now, directly at negative 2, we get an undefined value. And that shouldn't surprise you because that's what we did here. We found at x equals negative 2, h of x does not exist. But we did not find the limit. In fact, if we had written this on our paper, we would have gotten a point at least off. Because what we said here is we said that the limit does not exist. And that's not true. And if you state untrue math on the AP exam, you lose points. Okay? So the direct substitution suggested does not exist. But from the graph, the limit does exist. Hmm. Well, how do we take care of this? Well, let's go to the next page and see. Example 4 is a case where the limit does not equal the point, as h of negative 2 does not exist. But the limit, as we saw graphically, does exist. Right? If we go back to the graph, what are those as we approach negative 2? My y value is at like negative 0 .4, eh, 0 0.49 on one side. And over here, it's also negative 0.5. There we go, getting closer, negative 0.5. I bet we're getting closer to negative 0.5 or negative 1 half. So let's just put that as a guess for now, negative 0.5. So it looks like there's definitely a limit here. Now, in fact, when evaluating a limit, direct substitution wise, what we did up above, an answer of 0 over 0 does not mean the limit does not exist. It did mean the point didn't exist, but it doesn't actually tell us about a limit. We call this answer an indeterminate form. An indeterminate means unable to determine at this time. It tells us that evaluating the limit at the x value didn't work. And so we need to do more or try something else. What is the something else? Well, based on the graph, we can see that at x equals negative 2, right, and we saw this before, uh, there's a hole. Okay, and we've actually looked at that before. Um, we did that on our very first problem on the very first day of this. Um, so there is a hole. And a hole has a more technical term of a removable discontinuity, right? Discontinuous discontinuity. It's a spot where you have to pick up your pencil. Wouldn't you agree if you were walking across this, you have to pick up your pencil to skip over this gap that's right here and then continue drawing? Our function is not continuous there. And if it's a removable discontinuity, that implies that we can remove the problem point. 
And the way we've removed these issues before is by factoring and then simplifying. So this should allow us to find the limit without having to worry about the problem point. Let's try it right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function. But we said substituting in negative 2 is a big no-no, right? As soon as we do something like this, plus 6 times negative 2 plus 8 over negative 2 squared minus 4, you have already lost a point on the AP exam. Doesn't matter if you get the right answer later on, that is wrong because, oops, and I should leave off the limit here too. The reason this is wrong is because when you do this on your calculator, you get an error. You get does not exist. And this limit does not equal an error or does not exist. If we abuse an equal sign, if we state something that is untrue, this value equals does not exist, then you are wrong and you will lose a point. So instead, if you wanted to quickly check and see if you get that 0 over 0 case, just get rid of the equal sign. We're going to talk about this further on down the road when we get to a cool rule called L'Hopital's rule. We'll talk a little bit more clearly about what the notation should look like. But for now, let's go ahead and just say drop the equal sign between the limit and the evaluation. And then we can say over here this equals 0 over 0. That is a true statement. This fraction does equal 0 over 0. But we don't want to put in equals with the limit. Instead, we have gotten an answer of 0 over 0, which is indeterminate, and it tells us we need to do more. The do more is we need to factor. So the top, nothing too bad, right? x and x, we know we multiply and add, so that's got to be 4 and 2, right? 4 times 2 is 8. 2x and 4x is 6x. And the denominator looks like a difference of squares to me, x plus 2 times x minus 2. Sweet. Looking good so far. Then what? Oh, let's remove the discontinuity. Now what we've done is we've said we've made the limit as x approaches negative 2 only have to worry about the function that's x plus 4 over x minus 2. And you might say, foul, you can't do that. You just ignored the point that had the issue right at negative 2. And you're right. We did erase that point. But guess what? What do limits not talk about? Limits don't talk about what happens at the point. We don't care that negative 2 is a problem child. What we really care about is the fact that when you remove that hole, what we've now done, if you were to graph that function, is you would now have a beautiful function that runs and does the exact same thing as what's going on over here. It's not going to look like this function, but it's going to give us the same values of the function, at least around that point. And so now we're going to try direct substitution. Negative 2, no longer need the limit. Now we're finding out what happens at the point for this new function. And this gives us 4 minus 2, which is 2 over negative 4. And as we reduce, that looks like negative 1 half or negative 0.5. And I think, based on our graph, that is the right answer. This is the true value, and it doesn't matter, decimal or fraction, your choice, of the limit. So, long story short, maybe too late, if you get an indeterminate form, get rid of that equal sign, and then do something else, which means factor and try again. So why don't you try the two more examples down below, and then we'll check the graphs, see how you did, and come back together. Ready, set, go. All right, the first one was pretty straightforward. I think if you try substituting a negative 2 first, and by the way, um, there's a couple different um, rules of thought uh, about these limits. I would probably not try negative 2 in this. This seems like a lot of work. Uh, what I might try to do first is the do more step. But if you wanted to try substituting a negative 2 first, you'll find that you get 0 over 0. It's a do more problem. Now, the reason I probably wouldn't have started with that is I didn't want to do all the math. So I would have said, well, this looks like something we'll probably have to factor anyways. Let's just try factoring it now and save us the trouble. Now, if it didn't factor, then I would certainly go back to this part and substitute that in. Because usually the first step with any algebraic limit is direct substitution. You plug the value in. I'm just trying to save us some time. So let's go ahead and get this factored. 
something like this. Uh, the bottom one will be much easier because there's that one in front. So I know it's x and x. Multiply to make negative 6, add to make negative 1. It's got to be negative 3 and positive 2. Okay. Now the top one is going to be a little bit trickier because of that 2 out front. And you probably learned a bunch of shortcuts, but I'm going to give you one more. Again, cheating a bit and assuming something will cancel out here, I bet one of these factors will either be x plus 2 or x minus 3. But I know because of the 2x squared, this has to start with a 2x and x. And I also know that this cannot say plus 2, right? And we know it can't say plus 2 because um, with factoring, you can never have a common factor within a factor if there's no common factor up above. So I know that there can't be a 2 there. Um, I also know that there can't be a 6 here, same issue. So this option is either a plus 1 or a 1 or a, nope, <laughs> or a 3. Where am I coming up with those? I know that these last two values have to multiply to equal 6. 1 times 6, 2 times 3, 1, 2, 3, 4 numbers, but two of those can't go in the beginning, so it's either a 1 or a 3. All right, now which is which? Well, let's just guess. I mean, let's assume that it is a 1 to start. Now, if it's a 1, this other guy would have to be a 6, and I don't think that'll match any of the factors down below, so I bet it's not a 1 either. I bet it's going to be a 3. Okay, 3 times what is negative 6? Well, 3 times 2 is that 6. Then we have to say, what combination will give us the 1 here? This is 4, this is 3. I want it to be 4 minus 3, so positive 4 minus 3. And I think we've done it. This is 2x squared plus 4 minus 3, and we've got our answer. At this point, notice there is something to reduce. Haha! -ha. We end up here. And from here, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly substitute in the negative 2. 2 times negative 2 minus 3 over negative 2 minus 3. As we do the math, we get negative 4 minus 3 over negative 2 minus 3. Don't cancel the negative 3's. You can't cancel with addition and subtraction. This gives us negative 7 over negative 5, which I think would be more commonly written as 7 over 5. Okay, nothing too bad. Um, let's go ahead and check that graph really quickly. 7 over 5, let's see, 5 goes into 7 once and 2 fifths. I'm getting 1.4, so let's check this one out. 1.4 as we hit negative 2. So here is negative 2, and it looks like my y values are right around 1.4. Look at that. Oh, we've done well. We have 1 to go. The limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9. Let's switch up our colors. Okay, again, same thing. You could substitute in 3 first. 3 squared minus 9 over 3 minus 3. I'm pretty convinced that'll be 0 over 0. No equals with the limit. Do more. All right, let's factor. The limit as x approaches 3 of, we know the top one is a difference of squares. And the bottom one actually doesn't factor at all. I'll group it in parentheses to make it feel like it's fitting in now. Um, what do we do here? Well, you might say, oh, we just cancel those out. But I don't think you can cancel those out right away, can you? Look at these. In fact, let's rearrange the bottom just slightly uh, to see why we can't just cancel these straight away. If we rearrange the bottom, I'm going to move the x first. There's a negative attached to the x. So it becomes negative x, and this 3 is positive, right? It's positive 3 minus x, so plus 3. And you'll notice that that does not match either of the factors up above. The plus matches the first part, and the negative x matches none of them. Hmm, well that's frustrating. But let's try a handy dandy little trick here. And our trick is, this x probably has to be positive to cancel something up above. Both of these have positive x's. So I'm going to divide or factor out a negative 1 from both of these guys. The limit as x approaches 3, the top's not going to change at all, x minus 3 times x plus 3, divided by negative 1 times positive x minus 3. All right, that's looking pretty good now. Now we have two factors that can cancel. And in fact, if you start to recognize this pattern, you can go straight through there. You could say that these two guys cancel and leave you with a negative 1. However, the one thing you don't want to do is just say, oh, these cancel, and then put in the negative 1 later, 
right? That's not true. You can cancel and then write in a negative 1, but don't leave off the negative 1 if you cancel them. The negative 1 doesn't matter if it's in the numerator or denominator. In fact, I'm just going to slip and slide this negative 1 right here, just so we can see it doesn't make a difference. And then I think direct substitution will be just fine now. 3 plus 3 is 6 times negative 1. I'm getting negative 6. Let's check that graph really quickly as x approaches 3. Okay, as x approaches 3, that's down here. Oh yeah, we definitely get closer to negative 6, don't we? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, to finish off this algebraic substitution thing, a quick corollary, a quick connection. Um, an answer of a constant, like 7 or 50, divided by 0 is not indeterminate. Okay? So rather, this answer means that the limit does not exist. Let's try this quick example down below. Let's substitute 1 into both of these, 1 over the natural log of 1. We mentioned before we need to know any log of 1. Any log of 1 is always 0. 1 divided by 0 is not indeterminate. There's not a do more. This means does not exist. And graphically, you can see that as well. Right, we'll drop this one in and take a look at our corollary here. Um, if I zoom back out, notice as we approach 1, right, we certainly do not approach the same spot. We approach negative infinity here and positive infinity on the other side. So we can see this just from our limit, and we can say does not exist. Now, we mentioned limits equaling infinity briefly last class. Uh, we're going to forget about that for now. We'll come back to it over the next couple of classes. And for now, we're just going to say does not exist. All right, so here's our conclusion. Um, we'll discuss the official definition of continuity later in this unit. Uh, for now, we're just going to say a continuous function is where you don't have to pick up your pen. Um, we don't really even need to consider if a function is continuous to find the limit. Our general process for now should just be the following. Step one, try direct substitution, right? Plug in that x value. If you get an answer that's numerical, like 7 or 1.5 or anything like that, or you get a constant divided by 0, like this up above, you're done. However, when you try direct substitution, if you get an indeterminate form, such as 0 over 0, do more. And the only more, so far we know, is factoring and then simplifying. And that's our process. Now, the last part of today deals with something that we did at the beginning, and you're probably actually already able to do this one. It's not too bad. Um, piecewise functions. Okay? As long as the individual functions are continuous that make up the piecewise function, the only issue with the piecewise function is where the graph changes functions. There is a chance that the functions might not meet at the same y value. That was like on the opener where the parabola didn't meet the line. And if that's the case, the limit does not exist. Now, our concept is how to evaluate functions or find limits without graphing. So let's try two examples. I have two piecewise functions here for you. Let's see what you guys can do. As before, they are commonly asking you about what happens at a point and then a limit. Okay, so try problem one, no calculator. And then once you're done, unpause. We'll see how you did. Ready, set, go. All right. Let's tackle the easy ones first. Let's do a, c, and e, because they're just at a point. So h of 0. Let's see. 0 is not greater than 2. It's not equal to 2. 0 is less than 2, so I'm going to use this function. I'm going to use x squared minus 4 times x plus 4. And in fact, I'm just going to highlight that in green so we can see what I'm doing. And I'm pretty certain that that is equal to 4. Hooray! h of 3. Okay, well, it, let's see, 3 is not less than 2. It's not equal to 2. 3 is greater than 2. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use this function. Okay, so h of 3 is going to be 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 8. We need a little more room. We can continue with h of 3 equals to 9 minus 12 plus 8. I always like to do the positives first. This is 17 minus 12. I'm getting 5 here. And last but not least, h of 2 h of 2. Let's see, 2 is not less than 2, it's not greater. 2 is equal to 2. So h of 2, it just has an output of 3. That's easy. Sweet. Done. All right, limit time. The limit as x approaches 0 of h of x. Well, we have to picture where is 0. 
0 has nothing to do with this function. That's only for x is greater than 2. 0 has nothing to do with this function. That's only for x is equal to 2. 0 is solidly in the grips of this parabola. This parabola tackles everything for x is less than 2. And so if I'm going to find the limit as x approaches 0, all I need to do is find the limit of this top function. Right? That's going to be the limit as x approaches 0. We're going to state the branch of the function we're using first, which is x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then, because this is a continuous function, it's a parabola, we just substitute in 0. 0 squared minus 4 times 0 plus 4, which is, in fact, 4. Some students will ask, well, wait, can I skip from here to here? Yeah, that's fine, right? In order to earn correct points, you need to show a setup and an answer. However, I would ask that you don't skip from here to here. That's too vague for me. I don't know which part or which branch of h of x you're using, but as soon as you've stated the branch, if you can do all the rest of the math in your head and you just want to say that equals 4, that's fine. Okay, let's find the limit as we approach 3 of h of x. Uh, 3 is definitely greater than 2, so the only function that's involved here is x squared minus 4x plus 8. So x squared minus 4x plus 8. And we actually pretty much did this before, right? We're going to substitute 3 in. That's what we did over here. And we can see that that's 5. Great. All right. So far, the limit and the point have been the same thing. All right. Now we're on to h of 2. And the, ask us to find the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. So this is what happens for 2 exactly equal to 2. But how do we find the limit as we get closer to 2? Well, I'm actually going to show you a graph quickly, just so we can jump back to this. I think this will put this a little bit more in perspective, and then we can find these answers. So here is our piecewise function. You can see each of the pieces in here if you would like. Okay. We have this first parabola that stops at 2, right, undefined at 2. Then we have what happens exactly at 2. And then we have what happens to the right of 2. So when they are asking us to find the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side, the function that's in control of the left side is the function that uses x is less than 2. And so, in fact, what we're trying to find here is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side of just this parabola, x squared minus 4x plus 4. Now, you might be tempted to say that if you substitute 2 in for x here, you're not actually talking about what happens from the left side. You're actually finding the limit from both sides. And you're like, but there isn't both sides of this parabola. Well, there is. We stopped the parabola at 2, but technically this parabola goes forever, right? It is a full parabola. And if we're looking at the left side, a parabola's left side and right side approach the same spot. A parabola is continuous. So when you're asked to find the limit as we approach from one side, just substitute in the number. Don't even worry about that one-sided limit. So we don't need the limit anymore. It's just 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 4. This is 4 plus 4, which is 8. 8 minus 8, which is 0. And I think that agrees with our graph. As we approach from the left side, we get 0. All right, now that we get the idea, let's try to find the limit as we approach from the right side. Okay, the right side are x's that are greater than 2. And so that's got to be my orange function down here. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right side of x squared minus 4x plus 8. If you want to do the mental math, you can. I'm going to show the extra step, though. Just since I'm on the video, I don't want to make too many mistakes here, right? Um, this is 4 plus 8, which is 12. 12 minus 8 is 4. And if we look back here, we do indeed approach 4. Go us. So then the last question that might have been tricky says, what's the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x? Well, hopefully you can tell that because the left side and the right side of limits are not equal, that this limit is going to be does not exist. We always need to explain why a limit doesn't exist, unless they tell you not to. And so I'm just going to say something like because, and we're going to write what we did up above. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left side of h of x is not equal to the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side of h of x. We don't need to explain what those equal. We showed the correct math over here. However, if they hadn't asked us about these, let's pretend that this box 
and this box weren't here and they said what's the limit and you were able to do some mental math and you're like oh the limit is does not exist because these don't aren't equal you need more than that you would actually have to tell me what each side of these equaled and you would really have to show all the math in green and all the math in yellow that we did before so there'd be several lines further down explaining what branch of the function you used and what the actual value was all right one piecewise function to go this is our last one so try it and then unpause when you're ready to get your learning on ready set go all right we're back. Let's go ahead and find f of 0. Um, this piecewise function functions, pun intended, um, by really using this function everywhere. It says use this function as long as x isn't 5. And then they said, but if x is 5, then use this output. Okay, so for f of 0, 0 is not 5, so we're going to use this top function. It just becomes 0 squared minus 25 over 5 minus 0. Okay, this is negative 25 over 5. That's just negative 5. If we wanted to find the limit as x approaches 0, well, that's certainly not at 5. That's just in this function right here. Um, this function, by the way, I'm pretty sure is continuous just about everywhere except what value would break that function? Well, notice that functions break when you divide by 0. So the only thing that's going to break this function is if x is 5. Can you see that? Because then we would get dividing by 0, which is a bad day. So as long as we're not using 5, I think our function's going to function just fine. So all we need to do here is find the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared minus 25 over 5 minus x, which really means just substitute 0 in for the x's. And we did that over here. We found that that's negative 5. Okay, let's try another. f of 6. 6 also isn't 5, so it's that same function as before. 6 squared minus 25 over 5 minus 6. That's 36 minus 25 over negative 1. Those are 11 apart, so negative 11. And the limit, well, again, we're not at 5, so we're just going to be able to use that same direct substitution that we did before. I'm stating the branch of the function that I'm using, and then we can just substitute 6 in and get negative 11. What about f of 5? Well, f of 5, that's when x equals exactly 5, has an output of 0. Then let's look at the two limits, the limit as we approach 5 from the left side, and this is supposed to say the limit as we approach 5 from the right side. Well, as we approach 5 from the left side, what function's in control? Well, 5 from the left side means not at 5, it means close to 5. And which function uses values close to 5 but not 5? Well, that's our top function up here. So we're going to go ahead and find the limit as x approaches 5 from the left side of x squared minus 25 over 5 minus x. But if you substitute 5 in here, and I'm not going to do an equal sign, I'll just do it off to the side, right? 5 squared minus 25 over 5 minus 5, we're going to get 0 over 0. <gasps> Indeterminate. Ah, what do we do? Well, of course, we factor. Okay, so I'm going to go through over here. The limit as x approaches 5 from the left side of x plus 5 times x minus 5 over 5 minus x. Oh, there's that setup again we saw before. These opposites, right, are going to cancel and leave us with just a negative 1. Now we can substitute in 5, and this should get us negative 10. Awesome. If we wanted to do the right side, well, what functions in control the right side? Uh, the same function as before, right? The limit as x approaches 5 of x squared minus 25 over 5 minus x. And we've already done the math here, right? We did that earlier. This should be the right side. Um, it's the exact same thing. You would factor, cancel, and this is going to, again, equal negative 10. And this is, by the way, all the work that you need to show. If you can do that middle, those middle steps in your head, that's fine. Most of you would probably need to show the factored form first, I think. But again, we need a setup and an answer. The extra work you do in between is on you. So what about the limit as x approaches 5? Well, I'm pretty confident that that is just going to be negative 10. In fact, we didn't even need the one-sided limits here because as we approach 5 on both sides, 
it is just one function that's in control. It's just the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared minus 25 over 5 minus x. And as we've seen twice now, that's just negative 10. Now you might be saying, well wait, as you approach from both sides it's negative 10, but at 5 it's 0. Those are two different values. I feel like that means the limit doesn't exist. Well, check out the graph. If we get rid of this guy and turn on this one, here's our graph. I tried to show the three different colors here as we approach the left side, the right side, and at the point. Can you see as you approach 5 from both sides, don't you approach the same place? Right? You approach negative 10. Directly at 5, you're certainly not at negative 10, but limits don't care what happens at the point. This limit gets closer to the same point, which is negative 10. So hopefully that was very um, helpful in terms of your evaluating limits. We really went through three ideas here. The first is that you should always try with the limit to just directly substitute your limit, meaning if you approach a value, substitute that value into your equation. If you get an answer, you're done. However, if you don't get an answer and you get 0 over 0, that indeterminate form, then the second thing we focused on today is do more. And our do more, the only thing we know so far, is to factor. Last but not least, we discussed the case of piecewise functions and reminded you that limits don't talk about what happens at the point, only near the point. And piecewise functions can have an issue when we switch from one branch of the piecewise function to another. Anything else besides this value, like negative 10 here, would be easy. You just find the right equation and substitute in negative 10. But if it's at this, you need to find the one-sided limits and see if they're equal or not. So thanks for tuning in. Over the next few classes, we're going to take our idea of limits and really expand it to find more properties of functions. I'm excited to have you back for next class.